Hi, everyone. It's been a while. And if I'm back, you know, it can only mean one thing. It means it's conference season. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Marilyn. I'm the CEO and founder of Cosmic Centors, and we are a leadership, development, and organizational development consultancy. We help intentional, holistic leaders make better decisions about work and the workplace and affect sustainable change. Today, you are joining me for the first virtual event of our 2024 Cosmic Conference, although by no means the first event. We've had two in Dubai so far and one in Riyadh, and we just came out of an incredible offsite in Dubai this past Friday, still on a cloud from what an amazing day that was and the great leaders we had with us and the amazing speakers as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for our first virtual event as part of our two month long conference all about leadership polarities. I will be telling you a lot about the theme of this year in just a second. Um, and our conference this year is called the Cosmic Dance, Mastering Dualities in Leadership. Now, um, before I talk to you about this year's conference, I want to talk a little bit about the conference um, as a whole. And we've been hosting this conference for five years now, believe it or not. Our first ever conference was um, just me and Tala at the time at our dining room table hosting panels over two days um, back in July 2020, talking about the future of work. And since then, we've hosted five editions. This is our fifth. We've had many speakers. We counted 75, thousands of attendees and endless insights. Um, and it's been truly such a humbling experience to be able to learn together with our audience and our community um, and to cover themes that we felt were really important for the leaders we support. And in fact, over the years, we've hosted quite a few um, you know, valuable themes for our leaders. In 2020, we like to boast that we were the first people to do a Future of Work conference in July. Um, the following year, we were still locked up, if you guys remember. So we focused on helping leaders um, work with virtual teams and hybrid teams through our Future of Teams conference. 2022 was the year of quiet quitting, and we focused on helping leaders rethink the employee experience. And then last year, we worked on strategy execution because the strategy cycles of companies were coming to the end of a cycle and it was time for a new one. Um, and so across the years, we've also gone from a two day conference to a week long conference to three weeks to five. And this year, of course, even though last year we said we are never doing a five week event ever again, um, we are now doing two months because why not? Actually, we have a joke with the team that um, we use the chat GPT function. Um, and then every year we say more, more, more. Uh, and that's what it's been like. But it's been a true honor, honestly, hosting these sessions. And this year's conference is no different. So as you know, we are focusing on um, mastering dualities in leadership. Um, and this year, when it came to choosing a theme, we felt like it was different from the previous years. We didn't see, of course, there's AI and there's geopolitics, um, but we couldn't see something that was common across all of the leaders that we work with and that was very timely. And so instead we elected to choose something that we felt is universal, meaning it's shared by all leaders, but also it's timeless. Um, and that's the topic of dualities and polarities in leadership. And the truth is, let me put that into context for you about what this means, is that, and I'm sure you'll all relate to this, all leaders, and, and the more senior we become, the more we're faced with this, whether we've been in the C-suite for decades, whether we're first-time managers, we're always trying to navigate what feels like opposing demands, right? We try to be in the present and in the future. We try to engage our people, but we also try to be demanding on performance. Uh, if you're managing at PNL, you're looking at growth versus profit, efficiency, repeatability, process versus innovation, creativity, right? And even as leaders, we grapple with personal versus professional. How much time do we de dedicate to ourselves, our lives outside of work? Uh, and then how much of it is within work? And I think that as leaders, we learn, and it's a painful lesson to be sure, that actually what we have to do is to reposition ourselves on these spectrums. Um, because a lot of us, and that's normal, we tend to default to one side. We've all met or been these leaders at some point, right? They sound a little bit like a cliche. The chaotic entrepreneur who has amazing ideas and really has a good sense of the market, but can't build something that scales. Or 
the inflexible CFO who doesn't care about people and is only numbers driven, the soft leader, the tactical manager. We've we've all been or met some of these leaders when they, you know, have difficult time developing that range. Um, but, you know, great leaders uh, do work on developing that range and they understand that it can be a source of their superpower, this ability, you know, to dance across spectrums is what drives sustainable organizational growth and personal growth as well. And they learn to go from this, either this or that. I'm either in the present or in the future. I'm either focused on people engagement or performance to having a both and mentality. And that's really what drove you know, our choice of, um, of theme for this year. And in terms of our reference, why did we call it a cosmic dance? Of course, it's because we want to teach leaders to have that range, to be able to dance across the spectrum. Um, but for me personally, it's also a reference to the Nataraja, who is a depiction of Shiva. He's also known as the cosmic dancer. What a fitting, uh, you know, connection here. And, and their dance represents cosmic cycles, the cycles of creation and destruction, the cycle of the daily rhythm of birth and death. And through this dance, um, Shiva brings destruction, to be sure, but they also bring space for creation. Within that destruction, there now is the possibility for new things to come. Um, and that's really where the reference sits for us. And as I said earlier, I hope that throughout the conference um, today, and we have a bunch of online sessions uh, planned for all of you and those of you who've been able to attend the in-person sessions with us as well, our real hope is that you'll be able to gain insight on what polarities you struggle with, and how can you develop your range, both as a leader and within your organization? Um, and that's what this conference is going to be about. And as I said, the superpower of great leaders is this ability to think holistically, right? I speak a lot about this, actually. If you came to our conference last year, I really believe in holistic leadership, understanding that the impact that you have, that this happens within the context of an organization, which is a system. Um, and in order to influence that system, you have to be masters of complexity, you have to be masters of range, and you have to be really, really good at understanding the tensions in, in a system and be able to deal with them. And as we were researching, you know, the topic of polarities with more and more depth as we were preparing for this conference, it was also really interesting to note that polarities are not unique to leadership. We've found them to exist over time. We found them to exist across industries. You know, the yin yang symbol is one of the oldest in history. And we find these concepts in psychology, in coaching, in organizational development, in physics. Um, and so, this idea that we have to be good at mastering these paradoxes, um, these dualities, these polarities is not new. And I think humanity has been learning how to do that for centuries. Um, and what's really interesting about these polarities is that we often tend to think of them as opposing. But the truth is, and, and that's how the founder, you know, the creator of the first polarity map, Barry Johnson, defines them, is that these polarities are not problems to solve. They're not a choice to be made. They're actually interdependent pairs. And I really love the metaphor that he uses for this, which is that both are good. Let's take an example. If you inhaling and exhaling is a type of polarity. Inhaling is good. Exhaling is good. If you do any of them for too long, we know the consequence. Daytime and nighttime. We need both of these things to survive. And so the purpose of our conference really is to equip leaders with this ability to think of them as interdependent pairs, to think of them as positives on both sides and to develop our ability to navigate, to develop our ability to go from seeing them as a problem to solve to seeing them as a range to develop, to seeing, you know, thinking in linear terms from a this or that to thinking in complex terms as a this and that. And that's really what we're hoping to cover here together. And let me maybe put some extra, you know, meat on the bone with this one. Um, let's take an example of a polarity that I think we all experience just to kind of uh, put some context and start to have language around polarities and start to understand also why polarities need to be mastered um, and how they exist at different levels. So 
A polarity that we often deal with in organizations is one of centralization versus decentralization. Um, we all have worked uh, or been in companies where, let's say, we'll start over here and I'll show you the polarity map and, and uh, walk you through this um, as I go. But let's say that we are in a company that favors centralization. So let's say that's what's over here on the left pole. Everything has positives and negatives, including these models, right? So let's start with the values of centralization. There's a lot to be gained from centralization. It brings speed, innovation, focus, expertise, right? Um, so making decisions really fast, optimizing, being scalable. There's a lot of positives within the centralization piece. But then we spend too much time being centralized and what happens in our organization. We now travel down this infinity loop over here, right? We go into the dark side of centralization. We find that there is bureaucracy, rigidity, slowness. Um, we make more mistakes also because the decisions are being made by few and they don't have full visibility of context. And so what do most organizations do in that moment? And us humans behave the same way when it comes to our polarities. We react by swinging the pendulum to the other side. So we pull into decentralization. And to be sure, we pull into the positive side of decentralization. What do we start to find? Speed, innovation, focus, expertise. We're close to the customer. But too much of that too much decentralization. And what do we start to get? People get divided into groups. They become siloed. We start to see groupthink come into effect. We start to see people care more about their team, their group, their division than the function and the organization as a whole. We start to become myopic. And then what do organizations do? They pull back into centralization. And we've all been through companies that are going through cycles of reorganizing themselves constantly, going from this to the other. And what the polarity map and, and the discussion around polarity invites you to reflect on is how can we embrace both centralization and decentralization? What are the contexts in which one works better than the other? How can we know when we're spending too much time in one side of the pole versus the other? And how can we take the right actions in order to maintain the positive effects of both sides? And I think what's also really beautiful about polarity thinking is that it all depends on our greater purpose. Why do we want to do any of the things that we want to do? The other day, you know, in our in our in-person event, um, you know, someone said that the first time they finally wanted to address one of their polarities is when it was framed to them as the impact that they could have on the world, as opposed to just feedback. You know, we get a lot of these. I, for sure, and I'll talk about them in a minute, got a lot of feedback in my early years about being too soft or too strong or too much in the present, not enough in the future. And all of it felt very personal until it became clear to me as to why I wanted to master these polarities. And that's really the beauty of this approach and this tool. And before we, we you know, we, I'll spend some time sharing some of my own polarities. The last thing that I want to say, just theoretically about how polarities work, is that we've also seen that they work like a fractal meaning that they operate at every level of the system. And by that, we mean that we find them at the self level. So when we talk about polarities, I see leaders react and say, oh, yeah, I spend a lot of time worrying about this or thinking about this, or I've received a lot of feedback that I could be better at engaging my people, or I could be more focused on demanding performance. And I find it really hard to balance them. So that's really very quickly um, understood by leaders because we each bring our unique personalities, our natural inclinations to our role. This influences our leadership style, our decision-making, uh, and we recognize them and we need you know, support and tools in order to be able to conquer them. But the truth is it obviously also shows up in teams and particularly in leadership teams because each of us brings their own polarity into the team dynamics. And when we manage them well, they can be superpowers, but oftentimes what they sound like is you know, the risk averse person and the risk taker always fighting about something. We tend to see this a lot in teams. You know, we walk into a meeting, we know there's a decision to be made. And we know from the first minute that these two are going to fight about the same things all over again. And it's usually because they sit on opposing ends of the spectrum when it comes to their polarities. But strong leadership teams 
actually use this as a superpower. They use each other's polarities to balance each other out. They use each other's polarities to inform new ways of thinking and doing things and to improve effectiveness, collaboration, and really to improve the impact of the leadership team on the world. And then the last level, the org level. Organizations in and of themselves can have their own polarities. But also, a lot of our messaging around this and what you'll hear me talk about in our closing uh, keynote uh, just before we have our final event with Joe Santos, and I'll talk about all of those later, is this idea that good leaders don't you know, limit the learning to themselves or to their teams, but they take this idea of developing range and they scale it into company culture and operations. They build what we call ambidextrous organization that are both good at exploiting the current business, so being in the present, but also exploring future competitive advantages. They're good at profit and growth, right? Um, and they are able to also build cultures where paradox is, is well accepted. So they're able to build cultures where both experimentation and discipline are respected and sought out, both autonomy and oversight, you know, all of the different um, dualities or polarities that you can think of. And so over the course of the conference with our various speakers, we'll be exploring all of these levels. And at the end of the day, I'll announce, you know, the, the upcoming online events that you can take part in. Um, but to start with, I just wanted to maybe take a second here and reflect on some of the polarities that I've had to deal with as a leader um, over, I can now say I'm old enough to say this, uh, over the 20 odd years of experience that I've had, a little less than 20, but still. Um, and I think the first one, and, and many leaders are faced with this one as soon as they become middle managers, is the engagement and performance piece. I remember very early in my career, you know, I was a very competitive person. I was very driven. I just wanted to shine. And I did, you know, I put in the work in order to accomplish that. Um, and then when I first became a middle manager, I was given some targets by my um, CEO and mentor at the time. I did really well. You know, by September, um, I was all set on my targets. And I walked into the room expecting that I'd be showered with compliments. And my boss at the time spent the next about hour and a half telling me what a crappy manager I was. And the message that he was trying to send me and that I heard loud and clear was that actually I was so focused on performance that in becoming a middle manager, I had forgotten the engagement side of things. I had forgotten that actually my job is no longer to compete with the people around me. It's to nurture them, it's to help them become the best versions of themselves, um, that I had to shift my mindset. And as with the centralization, decentralization example that I earlier gave you, I swung the pendulum really far. So I went from pure performance focus to pure engagement focus um, to the point where there were many moments when I look back now where people just should not have been on the team or their lack of performance should have been dealt with in a much stronger way. And I didn't because I was so focused on engaging them, making them feel loved and cared for. Um, and again, the idea isn't that it's one or the other, it's that it should be this and the other. And then later in my career, I moved to a company that was pure performance. And once more, I, I had to lean back into a very different approach. Of course, I kept my engagement heart, um, but it taught me to balance things out. It taught me that both are important. It taught me that, you know, feedback is love. Uh, and that being tough on someone doesn't mean you don't care for them, quite the opposite. It's being nice that means you don't care for them. But kindness sometimes goes through being hard and making the hard decisions and giving the difficult feedback and being demanding. And that our job as leaders is to engage people so that they can do their best work. That's what we promise them. That's what we owe them. And that balancing the engagement and performance side really, really matter. Now, that's not to say I managed to do this every single day, um, but I think it, it, it's, a, it's a lesson that I hope to have conquered and that I really speak a lot about and support the people around me with because I think it's one of the first polarities that we encounter as leaders. Um, and the other day, one of our speakers towards engagement and performance said something really interesting. And they said, I will always underwrite your first mistake, meaning the people who work for me know that I have their backs, but you make the same mistake again, and then it's on you. 
And I think it's about that. It's about balancing both. I care about you. I love you, dare we say. I want you to grow. I want to be there for you. I want to support you. But also, I will demand performance from you because that is what I'm here for. Um, and if you'd like to explore this polarity, tomorrow night we'll be hosting a workshop where we'll, you know, organize people in different groups depending on the polarities that they feel strongest about and give them time and space uh, to reflect on those polarities and on how to master them at their own level. Now, the next polarity that I had to deal with is vision and execution. Throughout my career, up until I started Cosmic Centaurs, I had always been a number two to a really inspiring, visionary, innovative number one. And I had made myself believe, and by the way, the world will make you believe the same thing, that you're either this or that. So I thought I was always going to be a number two. So much so that when I started Cosmic Centaurs, I was like, great, I'm a great number two. I can execute, I can build, I'm really good at this, but I'm not a dreamer. I'm not an innovator, right? This language that we use about ourselves. And I even remember one of my mentors who I love and has been incredible otherwise, recommended this book to me called Rocket Fuel that fueled this idea even further, right? That actually great companies have one dreamer and one doer. We hear this a lot, right? This duo. And sure enough, of course, partnering, and we'll talk about that at the leadership team level, partnering with people who have opposing polarities is always a good thing, but it's a limiting belief that you can't be both in and of yourself. And so when I started Cosmic Centers, I had to come to terms with being both the visionary and the doer. I, it was me all alone, and I had to figure it out. And if I didn't figure it out, I'd be letting my company and the people who joined me and the clients we worked with down because I wouldn't build what was needed for them. And so I was kind of thrust into this. It was a bit of a cold bath. It took me a long time. I spent the first two years of Cosmic Centers trying to find the dreamer. And then I guess the beauty of it is that I found them within me um, and build that confidence and remove the self-limiting belief that I couldn't be both of those things. And I think that leads me into the third polarity that I personally spend a lot of time thinking about and worrying about is this idea of present versus future. You know, I really think that the role of leaders is eventually to build organizations that outlive them, that don't need them, and that really are able, as I mentioned earlier, to be ambidextrous, to be both in the present and in the future, exploiting, you know, the core business model that they're currently running, but also thinking about what comes next, because that's the only way for these companies to exist in the future is to continue innovating and, and finding new ways of doing things. Um, and today as a leader, I really, of course, in the early days of a company, you do a lot of being in the present. You do a lot of doing yourself. You know, you still have to, um, you know, may, do all the same tasks that you did on day one because we're still a very young company. But I've become very conscious that when I don't spend time in the future, it's almost physically limiting for me. I feel it in my body and my team knows it. Um, where I'm like, no, 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 I need to stop doing, I need to think about the future, because if we don't, then I'll be letting myself, you, our clients, and our community down, because my job is to be in the future. Um, and again, an, one of our speakers the other day shared a very beautiful lesson around the past, present, and future. Um, and, and, you know, the past as a source of knowledge and experience, but also a sunk cost, like there's no point spending too much time in the past as a leader, that you should spend time in the present and the future. And that some leaders, you know, innovators, entrepreneurs, they actually want to spend 80% of their time in the future, but you can't build a company doing that. Actually, you should probably spend 80% of your time in the present and make sure that you have time for the future, whether you're the entrepreneur who loves to live there or whether you're the doer like me, naturally, who tends to be really comfortable in the present, developing this need to be in the future at least 20% of the time and then return to the present so that you can build it is the way to go for leaders. And so, you know, I wanted to share a few of my own stories because I think and I'm hoping that as I'm sharing all of this, you're reflecting on your own polarities, your own moments of feeling like you're sitting on this range, on this spectrum and that you're not exactly dancing from one side to the other. And our hope really is that the conference and the time that we'll spend together will be an opportunity for you to reflect on these things, to develop the awareness, 
but also the muscle to take this forward and to develop your range. And so to close it off, I do want to invite you to join us uh, for our upcoming sessions. I think tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Uh, UAE time. And we have quite a few people signed up, but it's not too late. It's a virtual workshop, so there's no capacity problem there. If you'd like to join us, it's not too late. Where we will actually take the polarity map, so the tool that I showed you earlier, and we will explore it together. We'll get you to reflect on the polarities that you're struggling with and then work with peers who may be exploring the same polarity, perhaps from the other side of the pole, um, to think through how to maintain the plus side, how to find this third way, as we call it, um, where we can get the value from both sides of the pole. And then over the next couple of weeks, we have a bunch of online events uh, taking place um, with Ayub, with Gail, with Matt, and then the closing with Jose Santos, as well as a uh, closing by myself around how to scale polarities into organizations. Uh, so do, do join us for those and we'll leave the links to sign up to all of the events um, in the chat over here. Um, and then also, last but not least, if you happen uh, to be in Riyadh next week, we have our final in-person event uh, happening next week. We'll have a guest of honor, Mr. Yasser Juharji, who's the CEO of Nahdi Medical Company, truly an inspirational leader, someone who's done a lot of work on a personal and leadership team level around this concept of mastering their polarities and who will come and share their own experience. And I'm very much looking forward um, to having that conversation with him. Uh, so please do join us for all of these events. We'll leave the links for you so that you can sign up to them. And before I wrap up, if you've listened this far, thank you. Uh, a great big thanks as well to the centaurs who are always um, in the background making all of the magic happen and organizing this incredible conference. We've already had three in-person events, so we've really been able to touch into you know, how much this topic uh, feels important to the people that we support uh, and how much we've been able to help people you know, think through their polarities and we see the effect of it already. So please do join us for the virtual sessions. And as always, a great big thank you to all of our speakers uh, and partners on this. Um, you know, we've had Egon Zender in our in-person events. We've had Wissam Adib, Maria Beledi. Uh, next week, uh, more people will be joining us. And so we're incredibly grateful for the community as a whole, uh, for making time for this, for showing up, and for letting us know that this topic means something to them. So. Hoping to see you tomorrow night or in one of our future sessions. And thank you for sticking around all the way till the end. <laughs> <laughs>